Okay, so now we've been briefly acquainted with the groups SO2 and SO3, let's talk about homogeneous spaces. So to get used to this idea, let's revisit the case of SO2, where we saw that the group SO2 is essentially topologically the same thing as a circle. So what does this now mean? Well, essentially, all the points on this circle represent some particular element in the group. And we saw that we have one free parameter, so our only parameter is theta. We have a one-dimensional manifold. Now, one nice way that you can view a Lie group is essentially a manifold that is highly symmetric. And by symmetric, we're speaking in terms of group, group actions. We're essentially saying that this manifold is invariant under the group action. So group action, by group action, I essentially just mean com the composition on the manifold. So because it's a Lie group, we have to kind of remember it's a manifold. We're not just composing elements. We're kind of doing something to some geometry. The group action in the case of SO2 is just obviously going to rotate us in this plane. And essentially it's done by composing the angles of any two points in the group. And now you should hopefully be convinced that this is going to not do anything to this circle. If we just kind of shift all the points around by any amount, it's going to remain the circle. So if we have some element theta, it might act on the element phi to rotate it by an angle theta. And so we kind of phrase this in terms of group actions by saying the group acts on the point theta and the result is just some other point in the group, theta plus phi. So the group is a Lie, so, so, so the Lie group is essentially a manifold and that manifold can kind of act on itself by now a symmetry transformation. So this is the key point that Lie groups are heavily connected with symmetry. They essentially are geometric objects themselves that are invariant under the action of themselves, the Lie group. So if we have some Lie group, we can talk about the orbit of its group action, which is essentially if we take some point and then we act on it with all the elements in the group, where does that take us? It's going to just trace out some path in the Lie group, which is known as the orbit. So it's kind of trivial for the circle. The orbit of any point is just going to take us all the way around back to that same point. But this is terminology we're going to need to generalize this a bit further when we talk about homogeneous spaces now. Okay, so I introduced you to SO3 in the previous video, which we saw was this kind of ball, but it's not quite a ball in that the antipodal points have to be identified with each other. And it's a solid ball, it's completely filled all the way up to the origin, which corresponds to the identity. And now this is a rather complicated topological space. We can form well, it is going to be a symmetric space. We can act with the SO3. It will take us somewhere inside the group, and it's going to leave the group unchanged, essentially. But now we have lots of non-trivialities non in this kind of topological object. For example, the opposite points being identified means that we can create closed paths within our um, topological space that are Effectively, they can't be deformed to a single point, which means that this space is technically not a connected space. So, for example, this path which I've drawn here, simply corresponding to rotating from minus pi to plus pi around the z-axis, because these two points have to be effectively always glued together, no matter how we slide them around or try and deform this curve, we're not going to be able to shrink it to a point. And now this is a bit of a teaser for some kind of upcoming non-trivial stuff which we're going to see involving spinners. But essentially this group, we can't cover it with a single uh, continuous path like this. We have to effectively trace through this path once and then go back again. Then it becomes connected and we can deform this to a point. 
that's getting off track now, I don't want to go into that. But essentially now what we need to realise is that this is going to have non-trivial orbits. So for example, from any point in the manifold we can consider another point. How would we get to that point? Well, we can take any possible path through the group rather than just having this kind of single choice here. Okay, so now let's talk about homogeneous spaces. What we do when we form a homogeneous space is we essentially form an equivalence class of two groups. So I'll just give you the first example, which is going to be SO3. And now this is the quotient symbol for forming an equivalence class with SO2. Now a couple of things we should realise that this equivalence relation is essentially saying, okay, take all of the elements from SO3 which are going to be equivalent under the SO2 group action. So we essentially have to look at this, or not look at this picture, but look at SO3 and decide what are the SO3 elements that are essentially unchanged by doing an SO2 rotation. So now you'll be able to just think about this for a second, but if we have SO3, remember we have our axes, and how did we define the rotation? We said we choose our axis, which is a vector that points in any direction, and then we perform an SO2 rotation around that axis. So now if we're forming this equivalence class of SO3, which is essentially unchanged by doing an SO2 rotation, we're effectively just losing all the information that's contained in the length of this vector, because we're saying all of the points on this vector they correspond to doing some amount of SO2 rotation. They're all just now equivalent under this equivalence class. So all the information is specified in the length of the vector is lost, and we just essentially have the freedom to point this axis in any direction. So now what this is going to do is, is essentially we're just going to be left with now the surface of this ball, which is just going to be the sphere. So this is now a, a hollow kind of the shell of this ball, which is just the surface of a sphere, because we've said take all of our possible rotations, which is this solid ball, we've just realised that any vector is essentially all the points on the vector are equivalent because they just differ by some SO2 rotation. So if all of the points on the vector are equivalent, we might as well just say let's just choose any one of them, they're all going to be equally as valid. We don't want to choose the identity because then that's trivial. So let's just take the endpoint and say, where, where do all these endpoints of these vectors lie? Well, they lie on the surface of a sphere. So this homogeneous space, as it's now known, is equivalent to the surface of the sphere, S2. So we've realised, essentially, all the points that lie on S2 are going to be equivalent under the group action of SO2 and this kind of set which we formed, this equivalence relation, has the structure of S2. So I'll just state that now again. We form an equivalence relation which takes elements from SO3 and asks which elements are equivalent under an SO2 group action. So essentially if we rotate around which uh, three-dimensional rotations are going to be the same whether or not we've rotated around some two-dimensional plane. And now remember our three-dimensional rotations, we have them represented by some rotation axis, and then the length is how much we're rotating in the plane using SO2. So we're just essentially getting rid of all this information and just saying we can just have the freedom to point in any direction. And that just sweeps out the surface of a sphere. So we're going to see that this is going to now fully generalise. If you have SO n plus 1, and you form the equivalence relation with SO n, this is just going to be equivalent to the n-dimensional sphere. So these homogeneous spaces play an extremely important role in differential geometry. They are how we effectively create these um, symmetric spaces, as they're also called.
and we should realise that S2 is both going to be invariant under the action of SO2 and SO3 because essentially we can act on any group element in SO3 with either an SO3 element or an SO2 element and we've just realised that there is some kind of subset of this SO3 and a, an equivalence class of this big group is going to be a subset and we, that subset is essentially the subset which is unaffected by doing an SO2 rotation. So the sphere is a symmetric space. Obviously it's intuitively clear why it is a symmetric space, but now we have the mathematical justification for this. It's formed using this entirely group theoretic argument. We've effectively constructed geometry from nothing but Lie groups. Well, they are geometry themselves, but you can talk about them purely algebraically as group objects. So you can form topo topological objects in this way, and this is why Lie groups are so important for symmetric geometries and symmetry in general. Okay, so that was a bit of a hand-wavy video. I didn't really go too deep in the details, and I probably confused you at the beginning when I started talking about these orbits. Don't worry too much about that, just focus on the idea that we want to essentially take some subset of the group which is going to be equivalent under uh, a lower dimensional group and that's going to form a symmetric space.